What I'm about to share with you this morning is another case of plagiarism, another major instance, but it's extremely difficult to prove. This is one that I have not written a paper on. I'm not sure I ever will. All the evidence and all the analysis is in my two books, my ebooks, Matthew Franklin Whittier in His Own Words and Matthew Franklin Whittier in His Own World. But what I thought I'd do today is uh, by way of showing how these different parts of the tapestry, one piece over here, one piece over here, one piece over here, that nobody would ever think to connect, can be brought together and can be shown to have a bearing on this particular question. What I'm talking about is the plagiarism of Abby Poyan's work, and primarily I'm talking about her work as a 14-year-old girl, by her classroom teacher, Albert Pike. You may know of Albert Pike. You can look him up. I don't need to reiterate his personal history. Uh, he's kind of nefarious in many people's eyes. And uh, it's my contention that he was a plagiarist and that he got his reputation as a poet chiefly by stealing Abby's poetry. And then he didn't stop there. I'm sure he stole poetry of other people, but Abby was a child prodigy. She was a brilliant poet in her own right. And uh, so good that even her 14-year-old work was enough to make him famous briefly. So um, without further ado, I'm going to get into it. This is like learning a language, as I've suggested. And when you're getting into an entirely different field, it has its own nomenclature, its own little world. And it's hard to know where to get into it, because unless you start learning it, none of it makes sense. So you almost have to just dive in somewhere arbitrarily. You have to just start learning. You know, people learn a language by, you know, learning... Uh, travel phrases like, uh, you know, donde esta el baño, you know, <laughs> things like that. Where is the bathroom, you know? And then they work from there. And after a while, they have something to relate the second thing to. And the first thing relates to the second thing and the first thing. And then the fifth thing relates to the fourth thing, the third thing, and so on. And once they're in it, then they're in a territory that they start to understand. Well, this case is very much like that. I do not have the kinds of smoking guns and complete evidence that I have, say, for Edgar Allan Poe's false claim to the raven. This is more speculation. It's pieces of evidence here and there that fit in. And uh, I know the whole background. I'm not going to be able to prove this to you in an hour-long video, however long this takes. I can't bring in enough evidence. I can't make enough connections. There's too many gaps. If you read both of my books fully, you would understand. But uh, so where do we get into this? Um, I'm going to start at the end. And I'm going to launch my Kindle here while I'm speaking. Albert Pike became in later life a 33 degree Mason. So that, I believe that's the highest so he was like the head of the Masons uh, in Boston in the late 1800s. So he created a work for that order called, quote, The Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which was registered in 1871, and he wrote the preface So in third person. So we're going to look at something he said in the preface. And uh, there are people who have interpreted that he taught a form of Luciferianism. And there's other people who say, no, 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 that's not what he meant. Well, that is what he meant. He was a sociopath, in my estimation. Edgar Allan Poe was also a sociopath, and I mean in the full clinical sense. This means that it's like I'm colorblind in red and green. I cannot see green in particular. I can see maybe a little bit of red. Not reliably, but I can't see green, not the way other people see it. And a sociopath has no moral sense. They have to fake it. That they really don't have, they can't see it, they can't perceive it. So in Edgar Allan Poe's The Philosophy of Composition, when he talks about the moral power of an enclosed space, I think is the way he puts it. That's why, supposedly, why he set the raven in a room, see, because of the moral power of an enclosed space. 
that shows that he has no idea what morality is because a person who has real understanding and respect for morality would never talk like that. They've never used that term that way. It's, you know, so Poe doesn't understand morality. It's, it's all something he has to fake. And Albert Pike is the same way. He has no idea what morality is. So here, instead of plagiarizing and pretending that he has written the things that he has in this book, he knows he's going to get caught out. So he admits it up front and brags on it and excuses it. So that's what we're going to look at here. I'm going to read this part of the preface. In preparing this work, the grand commander, that's Pike, has been about equally author and compiler, capital A and C, since he has extracted quite half its contents from the works of the best writers and most philosophic or eloquent thinkers. Perhaps it would have been better and more acceptable if he had extracted more and written less. Well, now that sounds very modest and humble, doesn't it? Uh, first of all, I don't think it's half. I don't think he wrote anywhere near half. And secondly, it would indeed have been better and more acceptable, but he went right ahead and did it anyway. He continues, still, perhaps half of it is his own. This is a bald-faced lie, I think. But it's couched in such modesty that you would never suspect that this is actually a lie. Still, perhaps half of it is his own. And in incorporating here the thoughts and words of others, he has continually changed and added to the language often intermingling in the same sentences his words with theirs. Now, this is an admission, but it doesn't make it right. <laughs> it's like, oh, yes, I did murder that fellow, you know, <laughs> All right, but actually I just helped, you know, but I admit it, so that makes it okay. It not being intended for the world at large, he has felt at liberty to make from all accessible sources a compendium of the morals and dogma of the right, to remold sentences, change and add to words and phrases, combine them with his own, and use them as if they were his own, to be dealt with at his pleasure and so availed of as to make the whole most valuable for the purposes intended. Remember, this is a, this is a book on morals, <laughs> and he is admitting up front that he borrowed from a, plagiarized a great many people and messed with their words because it's okay, see, because it's just an in-house document, so it's okay. He claims, therefore, little of the merit of authorship, and has not cared to distinguish his own from that which he has taken from other sources, being quite willing that every portion of the book, in turn, may be regarded as borrowed from some old and better writer. Again, that makes it okay, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. This is a book on morals, and he's openly admitting that he's a flagrant plagiarist. But here's the part that he doesn't say. This has been his modus operandi all his life. Everything he published was done in this fashion. You see, that's the part. He's pretending like, oh, this is just an in-house thing that I don't claim any authorship for, so it's okay. But this is what he's been doing all his life. So, you know, a leper doesn't change his spots. If he's willing to do that now in a, in a document about morals, he's been willing to do this all his life. He just hasn't admitted it up until now. All right. Now, um, in a biography called The Life Story of Albert Pike by Fred W. Alsup, this published 1920. This is found on pages 102 and 103. He writes, this is a very favorable biography. A literary man in New York recently made the assertion that Pike was not an original thinker, but a great plagiarist. This critic was either unfair or not familiar with his writings. One cannot read Pike's poetry or prose without realizing that he had, quote, a taste for elevated joys, or without finding original gems that give evidence of not only talent, but versatile genius. He may not have been one of the greatest masters in that fine art of poetic literature, but his mind was certainly stored with knowledge and fanciful rhythmical pictures, which he had the ability to portray, 
he created beautiful thought pictures and diffused a noble philosophy. Well, this was a sociopath, so he didn't know anything about noble philosophy. The mistake that uh, this writer is making is how does he know that any of this material that he's using to establish Pike's brilliance, how does he know that it was Pike's work? If this fellow is a, a massive plagiarist, how does he know that any particular thing he looks at was actually Albert Pike's work? Well, it wasn't because he's a sociopath and anything that shows any sign of um, inner inspiration or morality was not his by definition. I know it's circular logic, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I have plenty of evidence that shows that this guy was a sociopath. And if he was a sociopath, anything that has heart in it is not his. Okay, so but but logically, this guy has no way of knowing whether the things that he assigns to Albert Pike's pen were in fact his. So therefore, he can't say. The most he can say is, I don't know. Anyway, I strongly feel that this literary man in New York that said this, that asserted that Pike was not an original thinker, but a great plagiarist, that was Matthew Franklin Whittier. Now, the, um, the fly in the ointment here is he said, a literary man in New York recently made, and this is published in 1920, Matthew died in 1883, but when was this written? You know, and I think he's quoting somebody that wrote back in Matthew's day, and he's not telling us that he's quoting somebody from the past. When he says, a literary man in New York recently made the assertion, that's a quote from somebody. That wasn't him. See? So he's, this is like, once removed, I'm pretty sure. So that was Matthew. Matthew was a literary figure in New York City undercover for many years, uh, back in from 1829 to 1836, and then again in 1844, you know, to 1846, and so on. So uh, Matthew was a literary man in New York, and I think he's the one that said this. Can't prove it. See, that's a dot where I got a bunch of dots in the middle that I can't connect, I have to connect over them. Where do we go next with this? I will tell you my conclusions about this before we get into the evidence, and then I'll show you the evidence for this. It took me a long time to figure this out, and I, I in my books, I show, more or less in order, how I got there, you know, from point A to point B, from one discovery to another to another, and the first discovery was this book, The Essayist, which is a young man's magazine edited by George W. Light, in which Matthew was signing both as Franklin Jr., where he extols Francis Quarles' poetry, and as the star, where he was reviewing books. That's, this is one of his earliest uses of the star signature. Well, I got there by finding Matthew's poem, Keep at Work in the Boston Chronotype, the first time it ever appeared publicly, signed Franklin, which was Matthew's middle name and one of his signatures, either F or Franklin. In, uh, in the essayist, he signed Franklin Jr. And uh, there in the Chronotype, this is the 1840s, he signed uh, Franklin. And the poem is Keep at Work. Then it starts showing up under George W. Light's name in other publications, see? But the first one was under Franklin. George W. Light never signed Franklin. So from there, I got to the essayist. From there, I found a compilation that George W. Light, actually, I think it was first, I found the compilation called Keep Cool and a few other poems or something like that, that Light published, I think it was 1853, which contains Keep at Work and several other poems, some of which were Abbey's. And then I traced him to the essayist way back to 1830, 31, 32, 33, I think it is, um, in which are Abbey's poems, some of which are unsigned, one of which has the editor's initials, and some of which are signed AP, which was claimed by Albert Pike, who had the same initials. Then I traced the same uh, signature to other publications like the Philadelphia uh, album, the American Monthly, I think it's called. And uh, I found gradually by looking at each of these poems, I realized that these were Abbey's, but that Albert Pike had done exactly what he said he did in the uh, 
Mason, you know, publication. I'm sorry, I'm really, really tired. So my mind is not working very well right now. But he did exactly what he said he did in the Masonic, uh, what is it, Morals and Dogma. Except he didn't tell anybody he'd done that. He, he claimed Abby's poem falsely for himself, including in his famous Hymns to the Gods series. He messed with it. He went in and, you know, put his own writing in there. And he published some of his own, which were awful. I've got an example of one that's just absolutely awful. I really should get it out and read it to you, but we'll get too far astray. But when you see the one that he wrote for himself, it's all about battle and blood and gore and blah, 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 you know. Well, little Abby Poyan, who loved the stars and was very ethereal at age 14, would never have written any such thing, you know. And yet Pike would supposedly claim all of them. Well... What Albert Pike apparently did was Abby must have taken his class in 1830 in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And there's a long story that I've extrapolated as to how she happened to take a class. I think her parents gave her an ultimatum. And the clues for this are embedded in some of the pieces I'm going to show you. That she was kind of a wild child. She was out in nature and she had no interest in any of the suitors that they would bring, uh, high class suitors because she had her eye on Matthew when she grew up. And uh, she liked to wander in nature. She was a nature mystic and a, and a mystic, and she would write poetry, and she would sing, and she studied her music. But she had no interest in, in anything, except I think that her father was going to send her away to a boarding school. This is what I remember. Now past life memory comes in. I strongly remember she was, they were about to send her to a boarding school, which would have been death to her. And uh, maybe in Paris, you know, where, where she would never see Matthew again. So her mother, who had taught her and who understood her, stepped in and said, well, here's, a, here's an idea. Maybe she could be a teacher. But if she, if she wants to be a teacher, she has to take on a student or two, see how she likes it, and go to some classes. So she took on Matthew and I think one other boy as students. And then she attended these classes. Well, she knew way more than her teacher, but her teacher ripped her off. So this is Albert Pike, who recognized how good she was. And he got into her workbook, as I've extrapolated, and stole both personal and class assignments out of her workbook and published them under their shared initials with the idea that if he ever got caught, he could have the perfect excuse, oh, I was just publishing them for my student. And if he never got caught, which he didn't, because Abby believed in turning the other cheek, then um, he would claim them for his own and then rework them, and which he did. Now, we're going to get into what I really wanted to talk about. All that's by way of background. So now we're going to get into the May 1833 edition of The Essayist. There it is. There's a poem in here, signed AP, and it is written from Arkansas in December 1832. Well, Albert Pike in uh, 1830, I think the winter of 1830, or I'll, I'll find out in a minute because it's in one of the references I'm going to read. Um, Albert Pike left Newburyport, kind of in a hurry apparently, and literally footed it to eventually to Arkansas. He ended up fighting for the Civil War, in the Civil War, as a general for the South. Remember, he was raised in Massachusetts. And honestly, I think that he decided that the safest place to be in a war is a general. I could be wrong, but I swear that's what comes to my mind. Well, this is written supposedly from Arkansas, and it's, it's, the title is To JMT. Now, I wasn't able to find it before I uh, started this entry, but I'm pretty sure I have checked, and JMT is the initials of one of Albert Pike's friends. But I don't think that was originally the initials. I think it was to MFW, and it's been changed. I'm going to read the poem, and you'll get a sense of what's going on here. Though my faults and my follies have broken the ties which bound other beings to me, though I seem like a star, remember Abby identifies with the star, Though I seem like a star which sunk from the skies to set in a sunless sea, yet still when the thought of thy friendship and love 
with its white wings my heart may enfold. That heart seems lit up with a flame from above, and its current is warm as of old. Though the world stamp my name with the seal of disgrace, though calumny hatred may urge, though the star of my fortune be mantled in haze, and may never in brightness emerge, one thought will arise, all my sorrows amid, like a beacon afar on the sea. Though I with the tempest and storm may be hid, thou wilt ever be faithful to me. Matthew is 21, and uh, Abby at this time is four years younger at 17. But these poems were written in 1830 or earlier. They were stolen in 1830 because that's when she was Albert Pike's student. So she would have written it no later or no older than age 14. But I have reason to believe they were written two years before that when she was 12. So this is a poem that Abby wrote at age 12, which Albert Pike has published from Arkansas as though it's his own to someone that's supposedly his friend in 1833. So there's another poem like this, which shows up in the September edition. Now this one is not signed from Arkansas, which is kind of interesting. The first one was, this one is not, and it's signed to E.P. Now Abby's sister, Elizabeth Poyan was, I believe she was married by this time. Her maiden name was Elizabeth Patton. Her grave is actually like five minutes drive that way um, in um, Evergreen Cemetery. And here's the way this one reads. This is also signed AP. Clearly it's about the same crisis. How sinks the sad and lonely heart amid the world's dim wilderness when not an eye with friendship's art gleams like the day star's silver dart, his somber path of life to bless. How sinks the heart when not a tone of friendship breathes upon its blight, when mid the world it seems alone, like a sad star which once hath shone, but sunk within a sunless night. So sets the star, but if there glides another star in quietly, to shine in splendor by its side, like some sweet, tender, loving bride, the night is like a sunlit sea. And so, whene'er I think on thee, upon thy love, thy faithfulness, though hid in guilt and misery, each other thought a torment be, that one doth never cease to bless a peak. And there, for those of you who like to freeze the frame, is the poem in the original source. This is a 12 year old, this is a 12 year old poetic prodigy writing to her sister, Elizabeth, her oldest sister. This is not Albert Pike. Now, here's the question. Did Albert Pike have any reason to feel ashamed of anything or is it all just imagination? See, well, he disavows that he does. And we're gonna see that right now. Um, this is what he says about why he left. Remember now, if he disavowed any kind of misconduct, he would never have written a poem talking about how deeply he felt about it, see? So, you know, one could make the case that, you know, Albert Pike, for the reasons I'll show in a minute, felt ashamed of the reason he really left Massachusetts. But why would he publish a poem like that? This is a sociopath. He does not have feelings like that. <laughs> he can mimic them, he can steal them, but he does not actually have that himself any more than I can see green. This shirt I've got on now, I think it's gray. If somebody told me this was green, I would start to see it as green. Right now, as I look at it, I can kind of sort of imagine this as green. I've got a program on my desktop called What Color? You can probably find it online. If you put if you launch this program, it has this little cursor. You put it over anything on the desktop, it will come up and tell you what color the thing is. So, you know, given that colors change in the, you know, copying process, if I took a still shot of this shirt, you know, and put it on my desktop and use this program, it might tell me it's green. I don't know. Well, Albert Pike is the same way with morality and, and conscience. 
He has no conscience. <laughs> he couldn't have written those poems. So this is from A Life of Albert Pike <clears throat> by Walter Lee Brown. This was published in 1997. I can show you uh, on the screen a copy of this. You can get into books like this with Google. You Google interior lines or you Google the name of the book, it'll come up with something that you can search in the text and then you can screen capture that. See, uh, I can't afford, I, I would love to support people by buying their books. I can't afford to, so I have to use techniques like that. Up to the winter of 1830-31, Pike had only thought of going to the West. He had made no definite plans to do so, but that winter, a new motive impelled him to leave. He fell in love with one of his students, quote, fair golden-haired Elizabeth Perkins. She was, he said later, his, quote, first sure enough true love and sweetheart, and he wanted to marry her but was too poor to tell her of his love. Since when did that stop anybody? Overcome with anguish from this frustrated love affair, Pike made up his mind early in 1831 to put both Elizabeth and New England out of his life. He had heard that Tennessee was a country of liberal people and of opportunity. Well, he wasn't liberal, so I don't know what liberal means here. He thought he would try his chances there. His friends, Luther Chase and Rufus Titcomb, decided to go with him. Pike's last evening in Newburyport was spent in his schoolroom under the Masonic Hall, where a group of his friends gave him and Chase and Titcomb a going-away party. Pike was sad for he, and this is a quote, had seen Elizabeth for the last time, had told her sister Carolyn that I was going away because I was too poor to hope to marry her, but had not said to herself a word of my intention, had kissed her sister for her because she pitied me and was to take the stage to Boston on my way west the next morning. Now, whenever a sociopath gives a reason for his actions, gives a motive, you better be suspicious. So, he says he kissed her sister for her because she pitied him. No, I don't think so. It was a night of wassail and carousal, of song and wine, and all the greater gaiety and laughter for the heartache that I could not hide, and the cause of which they knew. No, he was partying. <laughs> and when the morning star rose, they went with me home and bade me goodbye at daybreak of that cold, cheerless morning of the 10th of March, 1831, this is melodrama. This is somebody faking having a conscience. And I will show you how Matthew Franklin Whittier, in code, told us actually what happened. Is that interesting? You want to see what Matthew Franklin Whittier told us in code was actually happening? So let's see. Have I missed anything? We'll, we'll get to the Slander Club last because that shows what was really going on with Abby when she wrote those poems about being shunned. See? So let's see, we're going to now get into Matthew's code. Now, I know how to interpret Matthew's code. It's not so easy to convince a skeptic, let alone a cynic, that I'm correct in my interpretation of Matthew's code. Now, if I was a world famous expert and I said this and I asserted these things on the basis of my sheer authority, people would tend to say, well, he knows what he's talking about. Since I'm ridiculed, if I'm ever noticed at all, and I have no worldly authority, it's going to seem like I'm just grasping at straws. But I'm going to tell you now, I know what I'm talking about. I know how to interpret Matthew Franklin Whittier's code, both by 11 years of intense study and also because I was Matthew and I have the same higher mind that he did. So now, let's see. We're, there's two pieces that he wrote for the New York Constellation. I have told you that by 1830, Matthew Franklin Whittier, as a young man, was editing this newspaper in New York City under the editor-in-chief, Asa Green, who was probably busy running his bookstore there in New York City, and was I don't think he really was interested in running a newspaper. So Matthew had the whole thing to himself. And um, so he wrote lots of stories and essays and, and brought in other people's work, his brother's work, you know, to give his brother exposure and so on. He was running this thing. He wrote two stories, which are quite similar. Basically, it's the same story. And one of them came out in the January 22nd, 1831 edition. 
It's called Jonathan Jenks. Jonathan is basically a, a, a name that means a New Englander, like a rural New Englander. And then a year later, in the January 21st, 1832 edition, almost exactly a year later, to the, almost to the day, is a piece called No Ear for Music. And that one is also about Albert Pike. Both of these are veiled stories about Albert Pike and why he left Massachusetts. So let's start with the first one with Jonathan Jenks. I'm going to bring that up on my Kindle. I can't read this whole thing because the other one's even longer. I'll start it and I'll try to get into it a little bit and then I'll just summarize it. Jonathan Jenks was one of that large class in New England that support themselves two thirds of the year by the labor of their hands and the other third by the exercise of their brains who are farmers in summer and pedagogues in winter. This alternation of employments is admirably adapted to the condition of country schoolmasters, inasmuch as their intellectual parts, which are apt to become jaded in a literary race of three or four months, have ample time to rest during the season of agriculture. And he goes on, in other words, he's, he's introduced a country schoolmaster. And Albert Pike was, in fact, a country schoolmaster. His story is that he was attending Harvard, but he ran out of money or something and, and ended up working as a school teacher. Well, I think he partied and wasted his money and wasted his tuition money. And, and his only recourse was to be a teacher. That's the way I read it. You have to, you have to translate everything that Albert Pike says about himself and hence everything that's said about him with the assumption that he's a sociopath, basically. Um, so the gist of this is that there's a girl that he wants to take to the dance. One of his, his schoolmasters would get put up in the house of one of the students by the parents of one of the students. And this did in fact happen with Albert Pike. And he did in fact flirt with the, uh, two girls, as I recall, I don't have it in front of me of the household. So here we have about this time, Jonathan received an invitation to attend a dance at a neighboring town, Bouncing Betsy, for that was the name by which his hostess's daughter was called, was to be of the party. And as Bet knew the road and Jonathan did not, she considered it a fair pretext for inviting herself to a seat in the same sleigh with him. So where have we heard Betsy before? Betsy is what? Elizabeth, right? It's short for Elizabeth. Now, where have we heard anything about Elizabeth before? Oh, yes, it was A Life of Albert Pike by Walter Lee Brown. He had made no definite plans to do so, to go west, but that winter a new motive impelled him to leave. He fell in love with one of his students, fair golden-haired Elizabeth Perkins. Ah, Bouncing Betsy. Now, Bouncing Betsy could be called Bouncing Betsy because she loved to jump up and down at the dances. I don't think so. <laughs> I think Betsy, Bouncing Betsy got her nickname because she was buxom. <laughs> don't you? So here we have Elizabeth Perkins, Bouncing Betsy. Okay. And it goes on. And basically what happens here is that she wears him out at the dance. He can't keep up with her and he ends up crashing through a door and falling into a pile of potatoes or something like that. And when he found his way out of the cellar, he stole off alone in his sleigh, leaving his fair partner to find her way home as she could. So great was his mortification that he threw up his school and for the rest of the winter took to shoemaking in his native village. This is signed D. D was Matthew's definite go-to signature in the New York Constellation. There is no question that this one was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. It probably stood for Diogenes. It could also have doubled as a reference to a devil's, uh, a printer's devil, rather, which is a printer's assistant. Uh, so I think it probably was both, but that was definitely Matthew. So now we know that Albert Pike got into trouble somehow with one of his students, namely Elizabeth Perkins, and that he left in shame. He left his job in shame somehow or other. Okay, that's in January 31.
Now let's go to January 32, because now he's going to really tell us what happened. And this is a convoluted story, but it's something that he brought back from before. Now, Matthew did not plagiarize anyone's work, but he would essentially plagiarize his own work from years previous. I've shown any number of examples of that in this video blog and also in my written blog. I don't think I need to establish that. We know that. So this is how he opens. Remember, this is also sign D. So this is Matthew Franklin Whittier. The following story was originally published in the New England Galaxy some six or seven years since, and is now, after the manner of certain articles in a contemporary hebdomadal, republished in this paper, with such amendments as suggested themselves to the author in the reperusal of an early production. Sign D. The author signs it. Now, I didn't know at the time that I first discovered this that Matthew's relationship with the New England Galaxy goes back to 1825 when he was 12 years old and first started publishing in it. So this is 1832. 1825 is seven years earlier. Here he says that that story appeared some six or seven years since. I have not found it, but I guarantee that one of Matthew's early pieces, possibly with one of his own go-to signatures like NNK in that newspaper, this same story should be in there somewhere in 1825. And if I can ever get into the 1825 edition again, I may be able to find it. But that's the introduction. He's telling us that he has modified that story. Now, I think if you compare the first version with this version in 1832, you will see that he has revised this one specifically to refer to Albert Pike. That's the changes, I'm guessing. This is called No Ear for Music, and it has a quote. And the quote is, and I'll have to look up because I, did, I didn't do my homework here beforehand, and I've forgotten what I said this was. The man that hath no music in himself and is not moved with concord of sweet sounds is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. Let no such man be trusted. But look at what he's done. He's talking about someone who's tone deaf. That's the ostensible surface meaning of this story. But when he quotes, the quote refers to a sociopath who has no conscience and no intuitive appreciation of, of the refined spirit from within. See, he has no ability to really express anything that's inspired from the spirit because he's dead to that just like a man who's tone deaf can't hear music. That is the real theme of the story. This is a man who is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils, and cannot be trusted. You understand, this is not about somebody who's tone deaf. So already we're put on notice. And this is clearly about Albert Pike. So he's saying that Albert Pike is a sociopath. Okay? So now we go on. And by George, we have a tone deaf fellow who goes on and on about his tone deafness and his childhood. Now, this is typical Matthew fall biography. I've talked about this before. Look at Matthew's 1833 or 34 book, The Life and Adventures of Dr. Dodemus Duckworth, which is supposed to have been written by Asa Green. It was not. It was written by Matthew. It's a fall biography that uh, does It's a caricature of quack medicine, and he sets up a whole supposedly believable life of this person, which is all just, you know, fanciful. He does the same thing here. He tells this little biography of this, of this person in first person. And um, there's another reference in here that actually is a reference to Abby before she took the classes as to why she took the classes. Um, about how she used to love to be out in nature and listen to the frogs. He's brought that in, but uh, that's kind of neither here nor there. And then his music teacher and, and how he was tone deaf, and it's, it's all the fall biography thing. So it goes on. He goes to college, which Pike did go to college. Now here's an interesting thing. About this period of my life, I entered college. Among my classmates were several who were already skilled in the science of music, both vocal and instrumental, 
where of, while others, who composed by far the larger number, were just beginning to sing and play upon the different musical instruments, I now suffered perpetual martyrdom from the gratification of their taste, because he hates to listen to music. The remark of the frog, when he and his fellows were pelted with stones by the boys, presented itself with full force to my mind. Children, said he, though this may be sport to you, it is death to us. Now, Matthew has mentioned this somewhere before. I'm pretty sure it comes from an Aesop's fable, which Matthew loved, and he was the co-author of the English translation of La Fontaine's fables, as I've gone into before. Never mind that Elijah Wright got the credit for it. That was not Elijah Wright's fault. Matthew put him up to it. But Matthew particularly related and was fascinated by and interested in this particular analogy. The frogs say it's sport to you, but it's death to us. Well, this is the human dilemma. This is the dilemma of the cruelty of man to man. See, um, this is the dilemma of the sociopath. How can he think this is fun when it's, you know, cruelty and, and horrible to his victims and he has no compassion? So again, he's talking about a sociopath, but he's referring to it at a tangent with this particular quote, which he strongly resonates with. Now he goes on. He says, the winter vacation had now come, and I found some consolation in the prospect of quitting college for a season, just as Albert Pike did, just as we saw in the previous story. To escape more effectually from my troubles, I determined to take a school in some retired place in the country. And then he quotes another one here, in the transports of my joy, I exclaimed with the poet, oh, for a lodge in some vast wilderness, some boundless contiguity of shade where sound of trumpet, fiddle, drum, and fife might never reach me more. I will look that up and look at the stanzas before and after, and if I find anything, I will put them on the screen. So here he is, a school teacher, and he is invited to take this girl to a dance or he's invited to a country dance and he doesn't know who to invite so let's see how do we he's worried about it because he has no ear for music so he doesn't know that he can step in time my courage had mounted to the sticking point and i was prepared for the worst but where and how was i to procure a lady there was the rub for to go to a ball in the country unprovided with a partner is like the grenadier in the nursery song going to the alehouse without money. I'm not familiar with that reference. The oldest female in my school passed in the district for a, quote, likely girl. She dressed tidily and smoothed her hair with buttermilk in graceful undulations over a narrow strip of forehead. Somehow or other, she had learned that I was to be at the ball. Accordingly, she neglected none of those little artifices which women know so well how to use to recommend herself to my notice. She got all her lessons better than she was accustomed to get them and bestowed unusual pains in setting off her person to the greatest advantage. One morning she came to school long before the others. Around her neck, she wore the family string of gold beads and a pair of flame colored stockings on her feet. The beads rose and fell as she entered in short and rapid palpitations and her fiery feet peeped out from beneath her frock and seemed to ogle her most amorously. I had not the heart to resist appeals and hints like these, and I immediately gave her a verbal invitation to accompany me to the ball. Well, notice that the beads rose and fell as she entered in short and rapid palpitations. Bouncing Betsy is buxom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See how Matthew puts puts it this way here, and then he puts it this way over here, and then he kind of makes a reference to it over there. You have to put them all together, see? Well, anyway, he takes her to the, to the ball, and it's a disaster uh, because he has no ear for music. Um, let's see if he says that he left. 
He says, but I have suffered so much by music, have been persecuted so long with singing from cradle to the grave. No, not to the grave, but I shall soon be there if my misfortunes continue. That, quote, though it do split me, I must speak. I have endured not only the miseries which I have detailed, but I have been taunted by the thoughtless, upbraided by the wise, laughed at by the young, abhorred by the aged, and treated with ridicule and contempt wherever I have come, merely because I am so unfortunate as to have, quote, no ear for music. In other words, he's been persecuted because, because he has no ear for music, but we've already been put on notice at the beginning through that opening quote that no ear for music is a metaphor for having no conscience. So therefore, what he really means is this person has been persecuted for having no conscience. So Matthew gives him enough of the benefit of the doubt to suggest that Elizabeth Perkins seduced him. He'll give him that much, and there may have been some truth to that. Um, because that's the way he portrays it here. But that's what we're talking about. So Albert Pike, although he never would have admitted it, not even in poetry, did in fact have some reason to be ashamed and have some reason to have fled because I suspect he had sex with her, and I suspect that it was going to be a shotgun wedding, and he did not want to marry this country bumpkin. And he bugged out rather than face the shotgun. That's the obvious inference of all this. Um, but he, being a sociopath, would never have actually felt any remorse or expressed any remorse or, or for that matter, written such beautiful poetry. That was Abby. But what did she have to feel shunned about? You know, what was she being shunned about? You know, uh, what did she feel doesn't exactly express remorse. It tells us that her reputation was destroyed. It doesn't actually, the poetry as I read it, doesn't tell us that she felt ashamed for anything wrong that she had done. You know, it tells us that she was being shunned and her reputation was ruined and might never be restored, but that two people had stuck by her, which is to say Matthew and her oldest sister, Elizabeth. Now, what could it have been? That's where we go to Matthew writing for the New England Galaxy in 1828. This is around the middle. This is May of 1828. This must have happened to Abby in May of 1828. And at the end of this, we're going to see what it is that actually happened. Okay, but we're going to first go to these stories. And there's three in the series. This is a series about the Slander Club. Matthew's in Boston, but Abby has written to him, and he's gotten word of what happened. And uh, so he's going to make fun of these girls who are shunning Abby. He's going to make of them a slander club and ridicule them in three installments. And you can imagine how Abby must have laughed over these things, you know, and how she must have loved Matthew, her friend. They're not a, a romantic item at this point. This is her friend, her friend of four years older and her student. And he is supporting her in no uncertain terms with what he knows best, which is satire. So this is scathing satire, and it's directed against the girls who are slandering Abby back home in East Haverhill. Now, on May 16, 1828, we get the first this is the May 16, 1828 edition in the New England Galaxy, and the note to the editor reads, Mr. Editor, he's writing as the secretary for the Slander Club, as secretary to an association which has hitherto remained secret and silent within its own walls. I transmit for the information of the public a short report of our constitution and doings, which by a vote of the members will be continued from time to time. Our denomination is the, and it starts out, Slander Club, number one. And she goes on to describe the club, and Matthew is naming these characters Miss 
Alicia Scrimp, who's the treasurer, and Mrs. Patty Nervous, Miss Cicely Rednose, Miss Mrs. Lucinda Hauteur. <laughs> you get the idea. He is mercilessly ridiculing these girls and women who are slandering Abby. And she's loving it. See, you know, this is she takes herself very seriously. So this is the girl who's the, the serious Victorian at age 12, the, the child prodigy. And I have a story that I've shared earlier about Abby singing a very complicated aria for their local church. And you can see how serious she takes herself. See, um, here we have uh, Mrs. Dorothy Sleepy was absent. Mrs. Betty Tongue, the youngest member being under 40. You know, and it goes on and on. And Mrs. Smirk. <laughs> and he's just lambasting these people. Miss Tongue, Miss Rednose, and it goes on. She signs it per order, Dorothea Scrabble, Secretary, number 75, Gabble Square, Tuesday, May 13th. So that's the first one. I, I, it would take too long to read these. They're actually brilliant. They're very funny, and we would probably get quite a bit out of it if I read them. But um, I don't want to make these unnecessarily long. Uh, so we'll go to the second one. Matthew makes a cameo appearance in here as the border of one of the members of this club and uh, a poet. So there's some interesting things going on about that. Matthew also quotes a uh, poem about the, um, the blue stockings are crossing the border. I thought it was Matthew's poem. It's not. It's a British poem. He disavows it here in the text. Um, but Abby was a blue stocking crossing the border, which is to say crossing the border of male-dominated uh, philosophy, you know, and literature. The blue stockings were a group of women who were intellectuals. So he quotes that poem. Um, he has the character quote that poem. So it goes on and on like that. I don't really need to read them. Uh, there's one more in here. Just to mention that Matthew does make a cameo appearance as the boarder, who's a poet, who's very angry because the landlady has read one of his poems and so forth and so on. So that's the way that Matthew supported her. The, the last one comes in on the 30th of May. See if there's anything in here I can pull out. Miss Rednose, the corresponding secretary of the club, reported that she had received a communication from the Vermont Scandal Club. She believed it was situated somewhere about on the other side of the of Connecticut River, but she wasn't certain, censuring us for making our doings public and requesting in case we continued them that the head might be altered so as to include them for the proceedings were very similar, but they had 16 members. Club voted not to have anything to do with them, as we heard they were a scandalous set. Club called upon Miss Deborah Pinch to know, she's the one that stole Matthew's poem, to know if she had anything further from her poetical border. She declared that he had made the greatest piece of work she had ever heard on, and all about her harmless curiosity. He got in such a pucker that he threw the inkstand at her and spoiled her yellow petticoat, and then he left the house. Club voted, after very warm debate, not to engage him as our poet laureate, seven to six. Voted to exempt Miss Pinch from the payment of all fines for a space of one year in order to make up to her the value of her petticoat and border. Vote, seven to six, Miss Pinch having declined voting because they wouldn't give her something more. Then there's uh, Mrs. Innuendo, who had a nice little story. And uh, Miss Tongue was allowed to tell a story. Miss Patty Nervous and Miss Pinch together told a story, a long story, so intermingled with exclamations and expletives and so often interrupted by the wonderments of the club that I found it exceedingly difficult to record it. Okay, the long story had to do with a uh, scandal concerning a, a couple women. Order, order was cried by one or two of the married sisters who appeared to have been sitting upon thorns during the whole relation on motion of Mrs. Hauteur that the two ladies should be fined for telling scandalous stories, considerable debate arose, 
and the club decided that anything so true could not be scandal. As it wanted only five minutes of the usual hour of adjournment, the president recommended the members to be more punctual at the next meeting, and the club adjourned with the usual ceremonies. Dorothea Scrabble, secretary. So Matthew was supporting Abby in 1828, but what had she done? See, that's where we have to go to another publication. I'm going to put this over here and put the mouse over here. And we are now going to go to the gigantic volume of the 1850 Boston Weekly Museum. And let's see, I've got a problem because I don't have the pillow that I need. So I'm going to try to use a big pillow, which may give it a little bit more spine relief. And uh, I have to be pretty careful with this. This is not in the best of shape. It's splitting. Um, but here, and I'll show it up on the screen, I can't hold it up for you, is the April 20, 1850 edition. I'm going to have to bring down my light here where I can see what I'm doing. This is from the series that Matthew published posthumously for Abby. Most of them are short stories. They're all signed AP, which is to say the first one is signed AP. It appears in sometime in mid-1849. And this cannot be Albert Pike. It's the same signature as the poetry that he falsely claimed. But it cannot be Albert Pike for several reasons. I've discussed that recently. I don't think I'll go into that again. But it's definitely not Albert Pike. It could theoretically be somebody else. But logically, it can't be, because it would have to match on so many idiosyncratic points that it's just it's, it's a lost cause to try to attribute this to anybody but Abby Poyan. So this is Matthew publishing her work posthumously. This is called Willie of the Wayside. Now, this character, Willie of the Wayside, is a vagabond and, and an eccentric. And he's apparently known, he's wandering character, and he's known to be psychic, to give palm readings. Now, Abby brought in the occult and a number of her stories, but at the end, she would always explain it away or leave it ambiguous because she was afraid of being shunned. So now we have a clue as to why she may have been shunned in the first place. This story tells us she basically takes the character of Willie of the Wayside, who is said to be a feminine. So that's a clue that it's actually her. It's a long story. There's an explanation as to how he got this way. There's an explanation as to how he knew everything that he uh, told his uh, subjects when he was giving the palm reading. But again, Abby was a palm reader, apparently. And the gist of it is, without reading the story, the gist of it is that Willie comes through town and there's two sisters one of whom is more practical and one of whom is kind of uh, subject to flights of fancy. Well, the one who's subject to flights of fancy has fallen in love with a boy who's not any good for her, or won't be any good for her. And the practical sister wants to warn her away from him. So she conceives a plan to induce Willie of the Wayside to talk her out of it by giving her a palm reading and telling her that this boy is no good. See? And Willie of the Wayside reluctantly agrees, and he gives this reading and convinces the, uh, the first sister to stay away from the boy, and then he feels terrible remorse and leaves, that he's really done something wrong. Well, this, if I'm not mistaken, is veiled autobiography on Abby's part. She is telling us exactly what happened and how she got shunned. Apparently, this is the way I put this together. The local girls hated Abby. They were, excuse me, first of all, excuse me, I had to get my glasses. The local girls hated Abby. They were jealous of her. First off, she was from an upper class family. She didn't have anything to do with them. Um, she was much smarter than they were. She was French. Her family was, her father was a Marquis and it was a French family. 
he ra he raised the children in the French mode. I know that from a clue from her first cousin, Charles Poy and the Mesmerist in his book. It's a long story, but in his book, he came to live with her family for five months. And he says that he left to live in Lowell, Massachusetts to improve his English. Well, if they spoke English in the house, he wouldn't have had to leave to improve his English. So whether it was an excuse or not, clearly the family spoke French, which means that the Mar Joseph Poyen, her father, the Marquis, raised his children in the French pattern and they spoke French at home. Anyway, apparently she was persecuted. I had a past life memory or Abby told me, I'm not sure which, that uh, Matthew actually saved her from a group of girls that were taunting her once. And the French were persecuted in New England, even as late as the 1820s. You know, they were persecuted. So on all those counts, Abby was not liked. And they knew that she had been taught and knew palm reading and other paranormal things, but they couldn't catch her at it because she had been warned never to show any of those things to the locals, see? But these two girls played on her sympathies. They, I think they hatched a plot. We can get her to give us a palm reading if I beg her to please save my sister from this boy. And they tricked her. It was a sting operation, in other words. They tricked her into giving a palm reading out of sympathy. And then they ratted on her. Now, you couldn't get drowned for witchcraft in the 1820s, but you sure as heck could get shunned. And one of my two psychic mediums told me that she was in some kind of terrible trouble. Matter of fact, both of them did. But one of them in particular said that she was persecuted as a witch and that there was a trial with shouting, you know. Uh, and those psychic mediums made a, a tremendous number of hits. They were right in ways that they had no possible way of knowing many times over. I've talked about that before. So I think there's a very good chance they were right about this also, and that this particular psychic, Candace Zellner, had actually seen this event herself. So connecting these dots from all these different sources, what I put together is that Abby was tricked by some of the, a couple of the local girls into giving a palm reading, and she was put through some kind of witchcraft trial and shunned. And that it was a horrible, I mean, she was a very proper Victorian. She was a Christian. It was a better Christian than any of these girls were. And it was a horrible experience for her. And two people stuck by her, which was her oldest sister, Elizabeth, in particular, Elizabeth Patton, and Matthew, who wrote these scathing satires about the Slander Club to cheer her up. And then... Albert Pike, the sociopath, when she's forced to go to this class because her parents are about to send her, her father's about to send her to Paris to a boarding school, and she, as a compromise, she agrees to go to this class, her sociopathic teacher gets into her workbook, steals her private poems, and publishes them as his own, as though he's terribly guilt-ridden about something, which he isn't, <laughs> you know? So this is the kind of persecution that happens that happened for these two people. And it happened to Matthew as well. When he joined uh, his fortunes with Abby, she knew, I think she warned him, you're going to be shunned. You know, nobody's going to patronize your businesses and so on. And it did happen that way. And he didn't care. You know, as long as he had her, he really didn't care what anybody else thought. I'm at a, I'm at an hour, eight minutes now. Um, I don't know who will have gotten this far. But this entire history that's unfolded before my eyes from 11 years of deeply studying all of these different pieces and looking for the clues and connecting the dots, no one, nobody would ever guess this stuff. Nobody has ever guessed that Albert Pike got his fame, brief fame, as a poet, because he said he never could write like that again, see, when, you know, to his biographer, his brief fame as a poet, by stealing out of the workbook of his 14-year-old student. What an ass. You know, um, and then pretending to have some terrible remorse about something and then, you know, getting involved sexually with one of his students and, and, and bugging out quick before he could be forced to marry her. You know, I mean, this is the hidden history. I think it's kind of interesting. 
but at the very least, it'll show you how some of these things connect. Now, as far as writing a, a paper and proving these things to anybody in academia, I, you know, I mean, even when I can really connect the dots closely and have real smoking guns and real evidence, I still can't convince them. You know, imagine trying to convince them when the evidence is somewhat more tenuous like it is here. But I'm not wrong about this. I'm quite sure I'm not wrong about it. I hope you've enjoyed this, those of you who are interested in detective work. And I'm still waiting for the fake Ethan Spike. We'll see. Maybe that'll come in Monday.